coming in. I am Michael Gum, and this session, we are navigating your enrollment journey. Uh, what we tend to do and what we're going to look at today is what are the enrollment processes and how are those processes are engaged in, the, in your overall understanding of Morehouse, your overall understanding of what does it take to be an admitted student. And from those points, what are the channels that you need to be ready for? Um, so all our students get a pen and paper, all our parents get ready to engage as we have an amazing crew of enrollment leaders that we have right in front of you today. So again, welcome to Tiger Talks. You know how we do, this is our normal session where we get a chance to engage, build and network with some of the best uh, leaders to get you the information you need to know and bring those bring that information to you. All right, so again, I'm Michael Gum, the Director of Admissions at the college. I'm class of 2010 from Morehouse. Absolutely love Morehouse um, forever in my heart. Uh, I am happy to introduce and to have with us Dr. Natasha Crosby, who is the Director of Divisional Academic Advising. So Dr. Crosby, if you could just wave to everybody and let them know you're here. All right. And then we have Ms. Marie Brown, who is our registrar for the, for the college. She's basically the keeper of records for our institution. Marie, can you say hey to everyone? <laughs> and then we have Dr. Nige Lane, who's our Director of Housing and Residential Education. And Dr. Lane serves over housing. So all those housing conversations and questions you have, we have an amazing array of information for you today. So now let's get into a little bit more about the college and the sessions tonight. Uh, when we talk about Morehouse, you know, an institution that prides itself on leadership and excellence for over 150 years, the mission to develop men with disciplined minds who will leave lives of leadership and service an institution that offers a liberal arts college or a liberal arts understanding, while at the same time trying to get you to understand who you are so that then you can define yourself and then simply redefine the world. An amazing group of alumnus have graduated from the institution from Martin Luther King Jr. to Samuel L. Jackson to Spike Lee to Julian Bond, and the list goes on of some of the most amazing men that have made it out of the college. We are the only institution of our kind that will graduate 400 plus predominantly African-American men each year. And I think that that deserves a clap. I think that means something. And so it's amazing to be in this space with you tonight as we bring Morehouse to you, but then also bring our enrollment leaders to you. And I see we still getting people in this, in this chat. So I'm excited to see these numbers. All right. So the toppers covered today that you all are going to want to write down. And each presenter is going to talk to you about their subject matter. So we have the subject matter experts in front of you. The first topic is on academic advisement, divisional advising, advisor structure, the welcome email. You know, you gotta take those placement exams. So we had the math assessment as well as the foreign language assessment. Again, that's gonna be taught and an overview is gonna be done by Dr. Natasha Crosby. Registration. Our keeper of records, Marie Brown, is going to go over the FERPA process, transfer credits, enrollment verification. And then also, most importantly, you might want to know, how does the veteran services aspect work in terms of helping me sustain my enrollment at the institution? And of course, last but not least, um, housing and residential education. Dr. Nigel Lane is going to go over applying for housing. What are the deadlines? What are the costs? How do you pick a roommate? <laughs> so that's the housing structure and overview, living and learning communities, leadership opportunities and events. So it's going to be an amazing opportunity for you all to witness what does it mean and what does it take to be a Morehouse student while at the same time understanding what are the nuts and bolts to actually enroll into Morehouse College. All right. So I know, you know, I'm going to be quiet at this point. The floor is open to our lovely ladies. So Dr. Natasha Crosby, if you could take it from here. Thank you, Mr. Gum, and welcome this evening. So this evening, I'm gonna talk about the academic advising process that we will, you will engage in um, as you're getting ready to come see us in August. 
So first I wanna talk about how we have our advisors structured. So the division advisors are assigned to you based upon your major. And each of our majors are housed into one of four different divisions. And so each of our advisors are over one of those four divisions. So at the top here, we have Ms. Karen Carlos. She is over the business and economics division. The two major programs in that are gonna be business administration and economics. We have Ms. Ashley Hill. She is over our humanities, social sciences, media and arts division. She also advises undeclared students as well. We have Mr. Elamine, uh, uh, no, Mr. Ibrahim Elamine. I always go by the last name, but uh, he is over our STEM division, so our science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So he is over our STEM division. So that's all of your science um, majors. And then finally, myself, I advise professional and continuous studies division. So those students will be our education and kinesiology majors. So any other major I didn't say, any major that's not STEM. Kinesiology, education, business, or economics, they all fall under humanities, social sciences, media, and arts. So that's just the easiest way to uh, kind of figure that out. So you will be assigned an advisor based on your major. So once you have paid your acceptance deposit, you will receive a sample email like you see here on your screen from your actual advisor. So your advisor will send you a congratulations, you are coming to Morehouse email, and we send it to both your Morehouse email, we send it to your personal email, and we also send it to your parents' email address as well. So you will receive this email for, in very different, different avenues, and what this email is telling you is your to-do list. So what are the things you need to do in order for you to be registered finally for classes? So it goes through all of the steps and we need you to complete these steps. It also under each step has the deadline for when these things are due. The deadline is just that, it's the deadline. Do we want you to wait until the deadline to complete it? Absolutely not. Do not wait until the deadline to complete the things we're asking you to do. Please make sure, especially steps one through three, that you complete those as soon as possible. Do not wait to the last minute to complete them. So, but we give you all of the steps for each of the processes that you will go through. Again, this email is only sent to you after you paid your acceptance deposit. So one of the first steps that you will do, you will complete an advisement form, um, and I didn't say that in the last slide, but yes, you will complete an advisement form. This is for us to capture various information about you. The other piece is that we need you to complete the math assessment. So you have two assessments that you have to complete for us. One is a math assessment and one is a foreign language placement exam. The math assessment, we do this through the Alex system. We are asking that all students take this math exam. The reason why we're asking for all students to take this math exam, because if you're currently in a math course that is dual enrollment or, or you're in a different college taking a math class, we have to wait until you get those final grades. And sometimes that can delay the process. If you're in an AP class and we have to wait for your AP scores, they don't come out till July. So we are waiting for that score. So in the meantime, in between time, we're asking all students to take the math assessment. It does not mean those credits won't transfer. It does not mean when we get your AP score, we, will, we won't override your placement exam. We will, um, but we need you to take that math placement exam. You can, on that advisement form, indicate if you are anticipating AP credit for math, okay? So you can put that on that advisement form. You can also put in an advisement form if you're anticipating IB high level credit for math as well. And you can also indicate on that advisement form if you are anticipating transfer credits, whether dual enrollment or just straight transfer credits for math as well. So all of that information, you can indicate that on our form, but we are still asking everyone to please take the math test so that we can move you forward through this process and we're not delayed in moving you forward. 
The next assessment will be the foreign language assessment. So the foreign language assessment, every student at Morehouse College is required to take a foreign language. So therefore we need to figure out what level you should be starting in your language. And to figure that out, we have you take a foreign language assessment. So the test is offered for German, French, or Spanish. However, the college, we do offer Portuguese and Chinese. So if you would like to take Portuguese or Chinese, there is no test that you would need to take for this. You just need to indicate on that advisement form that you are planning on taking Portuguese or Chinese. And if you have prior experience with Chinese, please let your advisor know, and we will reach out to the program director for Chinese, and they can assess where your levels will be for Chinese. And the same goes for Portuguese. If you have prior experience with Portuguese, we can get that information sent over to the program chair for that language as well to assess where you should begin in those languages. Again, on that advisement form, you can indicate if you're anticipating AP credit for foreign language or IB credit at the high level for foreign language, or even if you have transfer credit, you can indicate that on that form. But if you do not have any of those credits and you're not anticipating those credits and you're planning on taking German, French, or Spanish, please make sure you take that foreign language placement exam. So that is all that I have for advising. I am open to, open to questions at the end of the session if you have more questions that you would like to discuss. And I'm gonna jump in there real quick and say, Dr. Crosby's <laughs> awesome work. If you, you know you had those advising questions and we see them coming in, there's already two. By all means, please, please, please ask your questions. So go ahead and start loading those in the chat. Uh, up next, we have our registrar, Marie Brown. Marie, take it away. Hi, I'm going to talk this evening about four different administrative things to make your transition from high school to the college really smooth. I first want to talk about um, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA. Um, it's a federal law that affords parents the right to have access to their student records and the right to make amendments. However, when a student turns 18, FERPA transfers from the parents to the student. Um, we have a link on here that has more information at our website. The most important piece is that at Morehouse, um, we have something called an eligible parent or the law provides for an eligible parent, but we require or we ask that each student complete a um, information release authorization form in order for their parents to be able to view um, their student information, their grades. We're also hoping that we'll be able to kick off when this new class comes in, something called proxy access, where um, students will be able to grant um, their parents the ability to log in with their own user ID and view their student record. But once again, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, it's really important and it protects the student um, and their right to privacy and so we want to just early emphasize that once again, when a student turns 18, they'll need to be doing that release form. Next, I am going to talk a little bit about, as Dr. Crosby shared, about transcripts. Um, as Dr. Crosby shared, we do accept any advanced um, placement credits, CLEP credits, and dual enrollment credits. But the most important piece about all of that is ensuring that we have an official high school transcript. For most of you, when you were accepted, you sent in a transcript, but it is not complete. It's not your final high school transcript. We need for that to come directly from your high school once you complete. Um, in May, uh, some, some students might be finishing in June. If you'll have that sent, that's a requirement in order to receive. Uh, it's a requirement of our admissions process, but it's also a requirement to receive federal financial aid. So again, uh, we're expecting to receive that transcript for any students um, that, uh, that we haven't received it, that haven't finished yet, that'll be finishing in May. And if you're sending in CLEP and AP scores, we need for those to come directly from the college board. And this is just a quick look at what that form looks like. You can go in and request that it's sent to Morehouse. 
Also related to transcript, I wanna move next to transfer credit. So I wanna make sure that we, you are aware that we um, accept transfer credit from regionally accredited colleges and universities. Um, a lot of times uh, students may think that a nationally accredited um, institution is higher than the regional, but the regional is really more strict. It needs to be an official transcript for those of you, again, that are receiving dual enrollment credit we need for that transcript to come directly from the college. You might be in a program where also those credits appear on your high school transcript, but in, our, in order for us to post that credit, in order for you to see it um, attached to your academic history at Morehouse, we need to receive an official transcript. Any grades of C or higher will be uh, transferred in. And typically, um, if we don't already have an established equivalency, with one of your um, schools, um, then we send that information over to our program directors um, so that they can help us determine equivalency. We have a number of equivalencies out there already. Um, that's at our website. You can click on established equivalencies and it'll bring up a list of colleges so that you can see what potentially you're taking, you're going to get transfer credit for. If you've already sent one transcript, an official transcript in, maybe from your first semester courses, you might already see those courses posted for those of you, once again, um, that have already been admitted. Last, next, I wanna talk a little bit about enrollment verifications. And the reason this is important is a lot of, a lot of you maybe per, uh, will begin looking at scholarships and will need to have um, proof that you've either been admitted. Some scholarships for incoming freshmen will accept um, the acceptance letter, um, but some may say we need an official letter. Um, we normally will provide those letters um, after you've been registered. That will occur sometime later on in May, um, a little later in May and June. Um, but also I wanted to just point out inside your My Portal, um, your Morehouse Portal, there is going to be an application called My Hub, where you'll be able to log in. We send that information to the clearinghouse once you're officially registered, and you can pull that information down yourself, print it. Um, it offers what we call excellent self-service for you to pull down any enrollment certificates and any good student discount cert for certificates for those of you that are going to remain on your parents' um car insurance. And so once again, when you're making those good grades, every little bit helps when you're trying to reduce the cost. And this is just a sample of what that enrollment certificate looks like. And then lastly, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about veteran services. Um, some students and parents who might who think that they might want to be able to use eligible benefits. Some of our parents that have um, been members of the military are able to transfer their funds. The biggest key here is please go out and apply. Um, if your parent or someone is transferring um, benefits to you, you will need to make application first with um, at www.va.gov. You'll then receive what we call a certificate of eligibility. And once you're registered every semester, including that very first one, students will be required to print out and complete the enrollment each term. And you'll send that information um, to our records office. Um, and what we do is we process that and we forward that information to the VA. But the most important or the key step is if you think you're using um, VA benefits, any type of the v different chapters, you'll need to go out and make sure that you've made application first with the VA. They'll send back a certificate of eligibility and then you'll forward that certificate of eligibility along with our certification form um, to the registrar's office. And that's all I have for now. Excellent work, Registrar Marie Brown. Awesome, awesome, thank you. All right, next up we have Ms. Nigel Lane, Dr. Nigel Lane, and before we do that, uh, we wanna put in a reminder, and this is very important. Family, go ahead. Utilize that Q&A at the bottom because those questions are going to hit and you're going to need those answers. So while they're triggering in your mind and as you're engaging in this content, go ahead and put your question in there and we will load it to make sure that we answer it at the end. So I uh, just want to make that, that tidbit. Dr. Lane, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, no problem. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Dr. Najee Capri Lane, and I serve as the Director of Housing and Residential Education here at the illustrious Morehouse College. So I think it was just really important to start off with our mission and our vision, because that's what guides the work that we do every single day when we are with these students. And so I'll quickly read through the mission of Morehouse College Department of Housing and Residential Education, which you'll hear as BHRE often, um, is to provide a living learning environment that promotes learning and development in the broadest sense, with an emphasis on supporting the academic mission of the institution. And then next, the vision for DHRE is to become a premier collegiate housing and residential education program. And when we say premier, that means the best to have ever done it. Whenever people are looking at something, starting something new as it pertains to housing, we want them to say, what are they doing over at Morehouse? And we want them to model it after what we are doing. So we take a lot of pride in the work that we do as we serve our students here in DHRE. So how to apply for housing, right? That's why we're all here. So it's a very simple process. So I will talk you through the requirements. So the requirements to apply for housing are first, to apply to and be admitted to Morehouse College. You probably guessed that part, right? And then the second piece is to have paid the admissions enrollment deposit. We get a lot of questions about, is there a separate um, housing deposit outside of the Morehouse um, admissions enrollment deposit. And it is everyone's lucky day. The answer is no, it's not separate. You pay one fee and you have access to all of this amazingness that we have here in housing. And then the second piece is the requirements to receive a housing assignment. Now I want everyone to really lean in on this piece because applying for housing and receiving an assignment, that's two different things. So one, when you apply for housing, you're just letting us know that you're interested. You kind of fill out the application. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you'll take a compatibility assessment because we want to pair you with someone who is a good fit for you. So the application is complete. It's done. That's great. So in order to actually get the assignment, that means me telling you or you receiving an email saying what room um, you'll be in and what house you'll be in, um, you have to do the following. And you can see here on our screen. So you must submit all required health documents. And that includes immunizations and COVID vaccinations, boosters and approved or waived um, through the point and click patient portal. One of my colleagues earlier mentioned or alluded to the Morehouse portal, which I, I'm pretty sure most people know what that is, but um, it is a portal that has a lot of apps in there that are resources to your enrollment process and even beyond. You will always use your Morehouse portal as you become a member of, of our family and our community. So you will find um, point and click in that portal. Next, in order to receive your housing assignment, you must complete mandatory placement exams, which Dr. Crosby spoke about earlier. Next, you'll need to meet with an academic advisor. Um, so please refer to emails from Maroon Tiger Advising. You'll need to enroll in your classes. That lets us know that you're actually a student. You've made the commitment. You're actually going to be here with us. And then lastly, students must satisfy the enrollment requirements and pay uh, and payment deadlines, excuse me, to avoid housing application or assignment cancellation. So you need to make sure you've done all of these bullet points and then you will get your housing assignment and it will be official, official, official. Um, and we'll be happy to welcome you here within our houses. So here are some important deadlines for those who like to take screenshots. That's me. I like to take screenshots of things so I can always reference it back in my phone later. Um, but Monday, April 1st, so that's right around the corner, the housing application opens for new students at 5 p.m. So you're going to log into that housing portal, well, excuse me, log into that Morehouse portal, look for Tiger Den, that's an application within the Morehouse portal, and you'll fill out the application. Super simple, um, very user-friendly. And then on May 1st, that is the housing application priority deadline for new students. So it's really important. I know there's a lot of fun stuff happening. There's prom and graduation and, you know, your attention is being pulled in a lot of directions. But I'm kind of leaning into our parents here on the call. Remember this date because we want all of our prospective and admitted students to go ahead and fill out the application by May 1st. That kind of lets us as the housing team know who's coming so that we can plan and put people where they need to be. Um, and if you apply by May 1st, we can guarantee that you will have housing. So I don't want to scare anybody. There's more than enough housing for our freshmen, but we also have upperclassmen students who want to live on campus as well. So just do everyone a favor if you can and apply by May 1st, and it will make your, your lives and my life a lot easier and smoother as we go on this journey together. 
So again, uh, priority deadline. I, I just kind of explained that about the, the May 1st date. And then next, I will jump to our last bullet, which is our ADA housing requests. So that's any student who may need accommodations. And what I mean by accommodations, it, it you know really runs the gamut. So that may be a student who requires, um, they have a service animal, right? So they may use a wheelchair to get around campus and to access just life in general. And so they may need an accommodation through housing um, or, you know, they're just different variations of why a student may need accommodations. It was formerly known as a disability services, but that's not really inclusive language. So you won't hear us say disability, it's an accommodation. And if you need that within housing, you're gonna go ahead and utilize um, the email that you see here, which is SAS, student accessibility services um, at morehouse.edu. So SAS at morehouse.edu. So again, specific room types cannot be guaranteed, but we will uh, assign if the rooms are available. So if a student really needs a single room and our ADA process um, confirms that they'll ask for documentation, we will do our, our best to try to accommodate that student because we want you to be happy and comfortable where you lay your head at night so that you can perform well in your living learning community. All right, money, 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 right? I know this is the part that people want to know about. How much is it going to cost, Dr. Lane, to live and to eat here on this campus? So um, I just kind of threw in some hard numbers. These numbers really don't fluctuate a lot for our first year students. So that first number is your traditional double occupancy um, price. So that's $4,060 per semester. And so most of our first year students, if not all, they will have a roommate. That's just kind of the way the could that's the way that the cookie crumbles. That's the way that we build brotherhood here on this campus. Um, that's kind of their family on this campus for that, that first year. They will have a roommate. So that's that traditional, traditional double occupancy price that you see there. So now we know where they're staying. They're staying in a room with their brother. It's great. What, what are they eating? Here are our meal plans that we have available. So a meal plan is required for students in traditional housing. You can't live in housing and not have a meal plan. We wanna make sure that our scholars are well taken care of and nourishing themselves as well. So um, all of our first year students have the unlimited meal plan. And that is, um, as you guessed, it's unlimited. They can go into the cafeteria and eat as much as they care to eat until they are full and satiated. And then that also comes with 230 declining balance dollars which we call DCBs here on this campus. So connected to your same ID card that you will use for everything here on this campus um, is also your DCB. So if you go to one of our retail spaces, um, so for example, if there's a pizza shop or there actually is a pizza shop here on campus, it's called Slim and Huskies and it's really delicious. So that's not a part of the cafeteria. This is like one of the fun places to eat on campus. You have your 230 declining balance dollars and it's just like having a gift card. You, you swipe it and that pizza was $10, so now you have $220, right? So you'll um, we really want to encourage our students to be responsible and be mindful of how they spend their DCBs so they can kind of stretch it out across the semester. So although I listed all of our meal plans here, the main one that our incoming students should, should focus on uh, um, is the unlimited meal plan. Now, if you choose to be a commuter student, maybe your family is local and you're, you're gonna stay at home, um, you can choose from any meal plan that you see listed here, but for our first year students living on campus, the unlimited is um, is what you will have. So housing structure and overview. Uh, there are 12 houses on campus. And so notice that I am not saying dorms. You'll go to other schools and they'll say, you know, we want to tell you about the dorms that we have. If anyone is a language person or bilingual, speak Spanish or Latin, we know that dorm comes from the word dormir, which means to sleep. And we're doing so much more than just providing a place for our scholars to sleep. We are in houses. This is where they have family. This is where they are loved. This is where they learn and grow. There's so much life and vibrancy that's happening in here. So do not call it a dorm. You please call it a house. You'll hear that language around often. So a little bit about our department. There are 11, 11 professional staff members and that is comprised of community directors, which I'll share in a second, um, an administrative assistant and an associate director, an assistant director, I left myself out, and a director, right? Um, so our community directors are professional staff members that actually live in the houses with our students. So we know that our students are adults, right? They're, most of them are 18, um, 17 going on 18, and we respect them as adults, but 
the community director is like the adult of the building. If something is going wrong or there's some concerns or roommate conflicts, that is that live-in staff member who's there to support and provide guidance 24-7 uh, because they live here, right? Uh, I'm also one of those people. I live here on campus as well. And then underneath our community directors are our resident advisors, which is probably something that most of us on the call are familiar with hearing. You'll, you'll hear RAs often. So that's a peer. That's another Morehouse student who's a year um, older than your students or, you know, our students who are on the call. So sophomores and above, they're student leaders and peer guides to help them through their years here at Morehouse in the residential setting. So really that big brother figure within housing. All right, so this part I think is super important, especially for our incoming students, because it kind of lets you know how we house our first year students. And so we really believe in living learning communities. So what, what does that mean? That means that we house our students based on their majors. So the people that you are sitting shoulder to shoulder with, your brothers that you're sitting shoulder to shoulder with in your classes, you also will be shoulder to shoulder with them in your residential spaces. And we not only we think, data shows that students who have that cohort of living and learning together, you're sitting in the classroom, you may be struggling, well, guess what? You you go back to your residential setting and you have, um, I'm sorry, my computer is doing weird things. Can someone confirm if you all can still hear me? Nadja, you keep on going, yes. Dr. Lane, you're good. Okay, perfect. My screen just kind of went blank. Okay, so um, as you're living and uh, as you're learning side to side with your brothers, you come back home to your residential house and you're able to um, just have that same camaraderie with the people that you actually live with. So it translates beautifully and our students do better. Studies show that our students who live in our residential spaces in these living learning com communities have higher GPAs than those who, who don't. So it's right there in, in the numbers and it's something that we care about. So I'll briefly talk us through the living learning community. So the first is BOSS, which our students came up with this acronym and it stands for Business Opportunities for the Sophisticated Scholar. Um, and that is, as you guessed it, for our business students, and that is in the Living Learning Center. That's the name of that house. ISTEM, that's your science, uh, technology, engineering, math, and that is in Brazil House. Evolution, which takes place in Graves House, focuses on the Black experience from slavery, the trajectory of the Black ex experience from slavery all the way through to present day with a focus on HBCUs and specifically the Atlanta experience. Um, and Du Bois House, that is our global leadership. I think it says it in the name. I don't have to go into detail. And then the last one is Signifying or Soul House. These are the majors that make you feel something. So think of the arts, think of um, the humanities. These are the different, the different majors that would exist within the Soul House. So those are our five living learning communities for our first year students here on campus. And then we have our leadership opportunities in housing. So you're a part of the housing community. You can be a part of the Residence Hall Association. So that's a little bit different than an RA. These are students who are volunteering their time to kind of build the experience for the students. They are the voice of the students, if you will. And then next we have our National Residence Hall Honorary, very similar to RHA, but, but their focus is on community service and recognition. So we want to get our students out of the four walls of Morehouse and get have them uh, give to, to the world. We, we know that they are leaders in that way. And then uh, lastly, recognizing people for their hard work and their effort. There's a lot of good work that happens on this campus and beyond. And so the NRHH focuses on highlighting and shining a light on those who may not be celebrated for the work that they do every single day, but their work is essential to our success on this campus. House councils, um, very similar to RHA. These are leadership or governing groups within the student body. And they just kind of talk about what needs to happen on the campus as it relates to housing. Again, another voice for the students. And then I've kind of talked about RAs already. That's that student leader who's being compensated for being a leader in the campus uh, within the residence hall. So it's a little bit different than the other ones because those are volunteer opportunities. And this is our last one. So I talked a lot about what it means to, or the process to get housing. I talked about who's actually in the house. And then this last slide is just a snippet of some of the things that we do in the house. And these are some programs that have been put on by our RAs in, the, in just the past semester. So some examples are movie nights, 
we do cookouts. We have a couple of barbecue grills here in the housing department. Uh, there are video game tournaments, March Madness, uh, resume workshops. So it's not just about having fun, but also preparing our students for the next phase of life. Um, how to tie a tie. Everyone may not have had that skill growing up or may not have been shown how to do that. Their big brothers will show them how to do that. Roller skating. We, we would really like to skate here on this campus. And then uh, worship service. For those who are interested, some of our RAs will put together Bible studies and different ways to worship in the, um, in the residential houses. So it's a really robust and interesting way that our students just commune together. Community is extremely paramount for us and what we do here and what keeps our students grounded and connected and and um yeah we just we enjoy what we do with them so that's a little bit about housing and how to apply for housing and what we do in housing awesome dr lane awesome awesome so uh that's a lot here right and so as we open up for q a or question and answer uh, what we want to do is be able to get your questions answered. So again, go to the bottom there under Q&A and you will actually be able to ask your questions. Um, we didn't get say this part in the beginning. So I want to make sure that we tell you congratulations on those students who have already been admitted to the university. We are super excited that you are making this place home. And the, our focus and vision is the, the hope that we can go ahead and make sure that not only do you have your questions answered, but that if there's other questions that you uh, are, you know need to know or things that you want to know, or if you have FAQs, that you have the resources. So we want to bring, again, our subject matter experts to you. So at this time, I'm going to ask that uh, Dr. Lane, Marie Brown, Dr. Crosby, if you three can come off mute for me, or not mute, but uh, turn your video on. And what we're going to do uh, in a minute here is they're going to bring us uh, to the forefront of the conversation. As that occurs, uh, I'm going to have a list of questions that I'll be going ahead and asking you. And from there, depending on the on the information, if it touches your area, you know, hit them. You know, like like I can tell you right now, Dr. Lane, there's some housing questions in here. Like, and it got loaded. It's not your fault. <laughs> but man, I was like, whoo. And I saw you, Dr. Crosby, you were answering some of those questions in the in-between, so good job. Um, so the first question is, Dr. Lane, can you repeat where students will apply for housing? And when will the application actually open? See, I told you, they're, they're smart. Yep, gotcha. Yeah. So you will apply for housing by going to the Morehouse portal. There is an icon or an application in there called Tiger Den. You'll click on Tiger Den and then you'll see apply for housing. So it's super intuitive, easy to follow along with, and it lives within the Morehouse portal. And that application date is April 1st. So um, I shared this, but in case you missed it, I really want people to hone in, especially our parents, because we know for our seniors, there's a lot going on, you know, senior year, you're, you're having fun and enjoying, but we really want to get our um, students applying for housing um, and getting all those requirements in place between April 1st and May 1st. So those are, you know, the two important dates. Very important dates. And and another question came in about housing. Um, do current Morehouse students have to submit updated health, uh, updated health documents to receive housing? So is yeah. it necessary to submit uh, updated health documents to in order to receive housing? And this is for returning students? Uh, I believe for new students and returning students. And I know, um, yeah, so the question is, do current Morehouse students have to submit um, updated health documents? So those documents that are necessary before actually uh, receiving housing. Got it. So if they've never lived with us before, then I'm going to say, yes, they need to submit it. Is that correct? Uh, I see some heads nodding. Yes. But if they are a brand new student, then they need to submit everything. Everything needs to be submitted. Yep. And that's uh, that's exactly right. At least on our enrollment calls, that's what we nail it through. <laughs> so okay. what I'll do is, uh, Marie, can you just kind of hint to that? I know as the registrar, as the keeper of records, uh, can you just kind of hint to that? And Dr. Lane, that was that was perfect. Yeah, so I do want to say once again for students, that is going to be one of the things that will delay you from being totally cleared and ready to move in. Um, we didn't really go into that this early. 
So uh, what Mr. Gum is talking about is once again, you immediately, we know of the FAFSA simplification issues, but as soon as you can get those documents completed, that would be great. Because while you will be able to apply, as Dr. Lane mentioned, once again, one of the things that's going to delay an assignment is the receipt of your health uh, forms. Excellent, excellent. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Lane, there's some housing, but trust me, Marie, I saw some other questions in here, so it's coming to you too. Uh, is there a way to look for potential roommates beforehand or is it all randomized? So do you just put in and you just shake it and pull a name? Or like, how does it work? <laughs> gotcha. So there are two answers to that question. Let's say there's someone that you know who's coming to more house and you know that you want a room with that person. You can let us know. And there's a section in the housing application where you can put in that person's name. So we'll try to pair you all together. But remember that um, our housing assignments are still based in majors. So you and if you and that person both have somewhat similar majors, and they don't have to be identical, but if both of you all are in STEM, um, then we will be able to place you all together, no problem. And then for those who don't have a person identified, there is an assessment, a compatibility assessment, and it's pretty intense. It's not, you know, overbearing, but it's asking very intentional questions such as, are you an early riser? Do you like having friends over? Do you consider yourself neat or a little bit more messy? You know, just um, you're taking two different people who've never lived together. One may be from Chicago, one may be from LA. What's your favorite type of temperature in the room? So at the end of the day, we're trying to put you with someone who's as compatible as possible. It may not be perfect, um, but we really try to put our best foot forward. And that's how the compat compatibility pairing matches. Um, and there's a percentage after everyone fills out the assessment, it will give a score. And we try to pair, I think, 80, 85% or higher, we would consider a good match for you all. So I hope that answers the rhyme. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. I'm uh, Dr. Lane, just a, a tidbit here. I remember when my twin brother and I were coming in and I was like, I don't want to be his roommate. And he was like, no, we're going to be roommates. And he was like, you live with me my whole life. <laughs> and I was like, no, we're going to be roommates. Uh, so it's good to know that, you know, you ask those questions about the morning, the evening, afternoon, you know, when you like to sleep, like that's really good information. Um, speaking of which, you know, I know certain information is not privy to everyone. So Marie, who does the FERPA form need to be submitted to and to ensure it's on file? So I think for some, you answer what is FERPA, right? And that touches all of us, right? But then at the same time, you know, who does it actually get submitted to? So it gets submitted to records at morehouse.edu. I did put the link. Someone had asked the question and I put the link to the form. We recommend for incoming freshmen, the form is good for a year that you submitted and completed by June, around June um, 1st, because that way it'll last the entire academic year. Um, but once again, I want to say something about the form. Um, we have what we call some static forms, um, which means they're paper forms, they're PDF forms. But this form, we've moved it and migrated it to uh, what we call a dynamic form. Um, using our form stack technology. So when a student completes the form, puts their M number and information and sign it, it's automatically sent directly to our office. Um, so once again, um, it's at the website. I did put the link there under registrar's office and forms. Um, and we recommend that students complete it um, sometime around the June timeframe. Um, but once again, there's nothing that prevents you from doing it now. You have an M number. The biggest piece is once again, we are looking as long as you're deposited, um, but parents have access to certain information for students that are under 18 now. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, you know, part of that uh, kind of question too, there's a question on here about like, when is admitted student day? And so I'm gonna answer that really quick, April 18th, 19th and 20th. And what's really great is the same three people you see on the screen outside of myself, uh, well, I'll be there too, but we'll all be there, uh, you know, for a mid student weekend. And it's going to be an awesome experience to kick the dirt, see the players, get a chance to engage and network while at the same time, learn the intricacies of our processes. The reason why I said, make sure you have a pen and paper is because we have tons of processes. There's a ton of information. It's a water hose effect at this point right, for you all. And it's important that you all are writing these things down. Okay. But we, again, we brought our subject matter experts to you to answer some of these amazing questions that you have. 
Um, Dr. Crosby, this one's coming directly to you. Uh, would you re recommend taking your placement exams before you apply for housing? And if you don't, would it cause a problem? Marie, you might be able to jump in there too, right? Um, and, and, and Dr. Lane too, right? So would you recommend taking your placement exams before you actually apply for housing? So with the placement exams and the housing, there's no order. Both can be done simultaneously. It does not mean do one first and then do the other. You can do both at the same time. There's no order in which they need to be completed, but both of them do need to be completed. Uh, but one doesn't have to be done before the other. Let me just say that. But your placement exams do need to be completed if you want to get an assignment. So there's a difference between applying for housing and getting a housing assignment. So you can apply for housing, but if you don't have all the other stuff done, you're not going to get assigned to a room. You won't have a space. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, both things can be done simultaneously as far as the application and the placement exam. And Marie? The only add? thing I'd add that um, Dr. Crosby is that once again, making sure that you've paid that deposit because that deposit yeah. is the trigger that allows you to apply for housing sure. and at the same time also will get sent the placement exam. And if I can add one more thing to that, um, it's not um, an automated system. I know sometimes people think, okay, I paid. So now the housing application is open. No, like it, you got to give it a little bit of time. So make sure that you pay, give it, give it a week or two, you know, just to be on the safe side. I'll, I'll let um, my other colleagues determine how much time they need. But if it were me, if I were in your shoes as students and parents, I would try to do pay as early as possible just to avoid any hiccup, hiccups, but it's not an immediate thing. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Nailed, you all nailed that and that's exactly right. You know, being punctual, being on time, adhering to deadlines is crucial for all of our areas. Um, and we have conversations, we have an enrollment call where we get on these things and we're able to engage and have real conversation about those steps and procedures. And so those are those are pivotal for us. Um, good question here. Are freshmen allowed to bring vehicles? Um, so Marie, Dr. Lane, if they are, would you recommend them to? I can jump in and say, I don't recommend it. And I think the school has gone back and forth. I've been here about five years, but I've heard two different things. So me as a director of housing, I don't think that a first year student needs a car on campus, especially if they live on campus. Um, we really want them to lock in, get connected, build the brotherhood, get situated with your classes and what it means to be a college student. That's enough. You don't need to go anywhere. <laughs> uh, everything that you need is right here on this campus. Um, so that's my recommendation as a leader, especially within housing. So I'll yield to others. Great. All right. And so we're recommending you get the full experience of Morehouse College. Leave your Honda Accord at home. <laughs> okay. Leave it at home so we can move forward and you can get all that wealth and knowledge. And it's true. We're in the inner city of Atlanta. So there's tons of things that you can do um, and engage. And there's nothing like being on the campus and being involved in activities and doing the things that are necessary. So thank you, Dr. Lane, for that. Um, the next question is, and it's pretty direct. It says, my 15-year-old is graduating with his associate's degree. Dr. Crosby is coming to you. Should he be considering a first year junior or something else? So, you know, he's pretty advanced. He's 15 years old. He's graduating with his associate's degree. How do we take that kind of student in Morehouse? So if this is his, if these were dual enrollment, meaning he were taking these college courses at the same time he was in high school, he's going to come to us as a first time freshman because this is the first time He's in college full time with no other high school to build with. And he's graduated from high school. That's the other piece. Um, but if he's applying to us as a true transfer student, then he would just be considered a transfer student. So, but yeah, go ahead, Marie. And, and what I'll add in, because maybe more the question is, is on the administrative side, depending on, so if the student, if we're able, we can grant up to 60 credits. And if the student is granted 60 credits, he'll be classified. Right. His academic classification would be a sophomore. He 
he'd be a full-fledged sophomore, maybe about to enter the junior. However, he still may have to do more courses. So remember, we take courses that are regionally accredited. Someone might've gone to Georgia State or Georgia Perimeter for their associates. All of those courses may not apply directly to the curriculum. They may apply as electives. So for all intents and purposes for the academic side, if we take up to 60 hours, then he would be classified um, as a sophomore student, um, a second semester sophomore. And um, once again, we know that there's some delays with the FAFSA, but for federal aid or receiving federal aid, and if he uh, opted to take out loans, he would therefore also qualify for the higher loan amount. Although everything Dr. Crosby said, we're gonna classify him as a first time freshman when he comes in. And that is so he'll receive the type of services that we give to first time freshmen. But he does have, that student would have the edge academically because they will have met some of those um, core course requirements and have some electives already under their belt toward that 120 hour. And also finally, if they need to access um, federal student loans, um, that will help them get the higher amount or the sophomore um, uh, loan amount. So I hope that helps answer the question. That's crystal clear right there. So I hope um, everybody understood what she just said. Um, it, it depends and not every class is transferable. And it, I know it also depends on the faculty and their decision making, but it also depends on um, what type of classes are coming over. They might not all come over as major classes or some could come over as Dr. As Marie Brown said, you know, could come over as electives or, you know, those kinds of things. So you need to you need to really assess that and let us assess those transcripts. That's what I would say. Uh, so that's important. So thank you, Marie. And thank you, uh, Dr. Crosby, for that. Um, Dr. Lane, do sports teams have specific housing for freshmen? So the the overall answer is no, but we try to group them together. We'll notice that there is a trend that a lot of them are grouped together, but there is, you know, no official um, like housing for first year freshmen who are athletes together, if that makes sense. Yep. And I'll just say that we're uh, molding academic athletes, right? Like, you know, we, we got the school stuff done and then we happen to be good in, in athletics as well. So, you know, we, we, we produce scholars over here um, <laughs> and athletes too. Uh, what specific payments have to be made in order to receive a housing assignment? So are there certain payments that need to be made to get an assignment? Um, you know, how does that process kind of work? And so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lane to obviously talk about housing and then Marie, some of the structural pieces, if you can kind of hint to that for us. Sure. So I'll jump in and say that to, again, to apply for housing and receive the housing assignment, you just need to pay the original deposit. But then when the payment deadline happens and you have not paid, you can lose your housing assignment. So I know that's a little nuanced, but again, to apply and receive the assignment, just the original um, deposit. But if you don't pay your overall bill um, by the payment deadline, you can lose the assignment. So I will add that um, there is a little nuance this year because of the FAFSA simplification. Traditionally, as Dr. Lane said, um, we do have a payment deadline. We are in discussions about what that would look like. Um, we have not been able to process yet any um, financial aid awards. Um, we know that students, our students have applied and we are working on a plan for that. So um, the most important deadline is May 1st. We're gonna reiterate that. Right now, We I saw that question out there as well. No decision has been made to extend that at this moment. Um, we're hoping that we can get um, some federal aid awards out. I don't work in the financial aid, but we're hoping that we'll get them out by before the May 1st deadline. Um, and so we know that folks want to know how much aid they're getting. They might want to see that first before making a final decision. But the drivers really are the deposit. We want to focus on those students that are interested in really coming. They have paid the deposit. And as Dr. Lane indicated, once you pay the deposit and Dr. Crosby what the drivers are, that opens up the application for you, that opens up the placement testing. Once you've done the placement testing, you're in line now to move forward um, for the next step, which would be 
um, which is gonna come a little later in May, and we're gonna talk about it Admitted Student Day, um, our registration Wednesdays, our advising Wednesdays. So we will be moving you along through that process. So really that's the trigger, the May 1st. Right now, we've tentatively said it's not at our website, um, that our payment deadline is gonna be August 5th. Um, that's a little later than what we've done before, um, but hopefully we'll have that information up at the website this week uh, coming up. But right now, once again, we're trying to remain as flexible because of the FAFSA simplification project from the Department of Ed um, has really uh, pushed a lot of institutions back. Um, so that's that's really the May 1st is our main deadline. Marie, thank you for hitting that. Dr. Lane, absolutely. Um, very, very critical information here, you all. Um, I just want to say there's been 105 questions. We'll just leave that alone. Um, <laughs> y'all are y'all are rocking it, so get ready. Um, what, sp <laughs> what specific payments have had to be made? So we answered that one. Can you reiterate what FERPA is, Marie? Um, does it need to be completed annually? So can you tell us what FERPA is or what it means? Yeah, it's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And short term, everybody calls it FERPA. It really just allows access. Here, here's the biggest thing. A lot of parents will call me and say, hey, I haven't heard from my, my student. And, you know, they said they're doing well. And Can you share their grades? No, no, I can't share their grades. And what we try to do, and I have facilitated some of these conversations, We'll try to reach the, the student. We'll ask the student to give their parents a call. I'm pretty sure housing has done this well. Also, you know, students get here and they may not. But we ask that if you complete that FERPA form when you call and you want to ask a question about, hey, I thought he was taking this course, and I, but he's really taking this course. Or what happened? That allows us to speak directly with you. As I mentioned, also, we're in the final stages of implementing a new um, process called proxy access where parents will be able to log in um, on their own using um, their own login to see their student's record. The student makes decisions and say, I want my parent to be able to see my bill because guess what? They're paying the bill. So I want them to see how much the charge is and when the deadline. They would also be able to check off, you know, whether they want them to see their registration um, and their grades. And so we're hoping by the start of this academic year, um, sometime around the 1st of July or August, we'll have proxy access um, in place. We're doing some testing now. But FERPA just really protects the student and ensures that we're not sharing information with folks that um, don't have access to it or the student doesn't want to have access to it. There is a little clause called, once again, an eligible parent, a parent that claims the student on their um, tax return the problem with that, sometimes we're not able to see only financial aid has access to that information. So this is why, again, we prefer, it's such an easy form for the student to fill out the, the form. Um, we ask a couple of questions so we'll know who the parent is when they call. Um, because, you know, one parent um, may claim the student on their income tax and the other st the student may really stay with another parent. And so once again, because everyone at the campus doesn't have information to that sensitive information, the quickest way to ensure access for your parents, and we want students to feel comfortable. You should want your parents to see what's going on. And so we encourage, and we'll you'll hear this throughout the life cycle of you enrolling. You're going to hear this at admitted student day. You're going to hear it at orientation when they drop you off. We have a lot of parents saying, coming up saying, where's that FERPA form? I need him to fill it out right now. And we'll say, go to our website. So once again, that's the quickest way for your parent and for the parent to be in the know. But it is at our website. And I did put the link in one of the questions. Thank you, Marie. Um, and again, you'll be able to reference that on the website. Um, and so, yes, FERPA. And then quickly, does it need to be completed annually? It does. It does. Right. It would be, Yes. And we normally send that out. We send that out when registration starts. So we would send it out and say, hey, you might want to update your FERPA form because once again, which is one of the reasons we always ask that you fill it out around June. So it would expire around the end of the spring term in May. And then you fill it out again um, next June. The student would fill it out the following June for the full year. Thank you. Perfect. See, I told you it's a lot of information, you all, but it's so critical. Um, and thank you, panelists. Um, 
this question is actually going to Dr. Crosby to confirm both the math and foreign language assessments are required. Where will the students take the assessments? Yes, both are required and you take the assessment once you pay the deposit. You will receive an email from your advisor with the information on how to take the assessments and the instructions. And so you want to take them as soon as possible so we can start moving you through the early enrollment process. All right. And that's going to their Morehouse email. Morehouse email, their personal email, and okay. the parent email. All right. So, so all emails we got on file. <laughs> look, so your what you put in your application is coming to you. Okay? It's coming. <laughs> yeah. But she said a key, pay that deposit, right? Um, that's going to be, that's that's the ticket, you all. That's the trigger for all the other components to open up for you, okay? Um, great for that. And does Morehouse allow scholarship stacking or do you practice scholarship displacement? So we don't have a financial aid person on the call, let alone, I do not want to speak for our amazing student accounts representative, but what we will say, admissions and institutional advancement did we do between the two offices offer scholarship dollars along with the financial aid office? Um, and in focusing on scholarship stacking, I think the idea more so is to focus on what your what how much your scholarship is and how much merit based scholarships you're receiving. Scholarship stacking can happen all day as long as you get external scholarships. When you're talking about institutional scholarships, it can vary. You know, if you're getting a, a scholarship that's $50,000 a year and you receive an MCOS scholarship, which is our, our, our direct funding merit scholarship, we might reduce the MCOS scholarship or take that fully away because the cost of attendance is now being covered from the, from the, the $50,000 scholarship. And so it won't stack in that way where you're getting a full refund, like the ways that some of us are used to getting them. <laughs> We're going to make sure that you know, it's up to the cost of attendance. Now, any external scholarships that you receive, by all means, you know, we'll remove the institutional scholarship and the external will take the place. So it's a conversation that you have to have with the financial aid office, with the Office of Institutional uh, Advancement, as well as admissions to predetermine what you're actually eligible for and what you're actually receiving. So I hope that helped in terms of answering that question. Um, what are the COVID vaccine requirements? Do students have to take both the original vaccines and boosters? We will have a segment with the medical component, um, but Marie, I will call on you and, and Dr. Lane as well. In terms of your knowledge base on uh, those uh, uh, vaccine requirements, right? Um, what is now the requirement that Morehouse has uh, to ensure that we are in compliance what are some of the conversations that we're having to ensure that we're able to uh, put that check mark on there to get through the registration process? So I'll go with Marie. So, so Dr. Lang, so I'll, I'll, yeah, I was gonna say that. So we, we do require, once again, the COVID test, I mean, the COVID vaccine is a requirement, of course, because there is a, you have to wait a couple of weeks um, to take the booster. I do believe we allow students that have only had their first shot to actually um, arrive on campus or check in um, if they had recently had it, but it is a requirement if I'm not mistaken. So correct me, Dr. Lane, if I'm wrong. Yes, and I would take it a step further. Again, I'm, I would need to you know refer back. It's been a minute since I looked at these requirements, um, but to my understanding, I think they had to have both shots and one booster to live in housing, yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So please, you know, take that into into effect. Um, what Dr. Lane, as well as what our registrar Marie Brown has mentioned. Um, what is the foreign language requirement to graduate? So this is kind of hitting to Dr. Crosby and uh, our registrar Marie Brown. Um, and I think what they're asking really in that question is what, how many years of foreign language do you have to have in order to graduate? So we'll go with uh, Dr. Crosby and then Marie, if you need a follow-up. So the requirement for foreign language is that require that foreign language has to be completed at the first intermediate level. So for us, that's the 201 level. But again, you're taking that foreign language placement 
exam to determine where you will start in your language. So if you're starting at our elementary language one, so if you're starting at that one-on-one -on -one level, then you would need three semesters because you're doing the one-on-one, -on -one, the 102, and then the 201. If you're starting at elementary two of the language, you will do just the 102 and the 201. And so, but the point is you have to get to that first intermediate level, which is the 201. So it varies depending on where you start in the language. And I, I, I'm going to say this right quick because uh, this question was asked, but I think it is to the masses. So the placement test, it's not a, like a score, a pass fail type of thing. The placement tests are used to help us identify where you're starting in math and where you need to start in your language. So that's why we have them. So we know where you are starting. So we want to set you up for success and not failure. And to do that, we need to know what you already know, how much you already know, so we can start you at the right level. Very good. Marie, any follow-up there? Yep. It's all good. That's that's awesome. And I know you all are also probably responding in the chat. So we appreciate that. Um, so thank you. Um, how does housing work for honor students? So those students who are honor students, I think we're we call them the uh the the Howard Thurman scholars. How does it how does it work for them in terms of housing, Dr. Lane? Sure. Yeah. So a majority, not all, but a majority of our Honor students are housed in graves traditionally, but I want to put this out here so it's landing on, on all of our ears at one time. There are way more honor students than there are beds and graves. So I say that to say, don't feel sad or left out if you don't get a bed space in graves. You will still find brotherhood and community um, and, you know, your honors people, even if you don't get a, a space in graves. But yes, traditionally, they are housed in graves. Thank you, Dr. Lane. Um, if you have multiple kids in college and are paying the Parent PLUS loans back, can a freshman student get an exemption to live off campus in order to save on room and board? Ooh. So, you got it, Dr. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, the I think the short answer is yes. There are a few exemptions for living off campus for first year students. Um, and I think that one would be appropriate. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lane. How do we access the Morehouse student email? My son tried logging in through Outlook and it didn't work. So this is what we call the credentials process. Uh, credentials are sent out to students once they're actually admitted to the university and uh, upon their acceptance. So you'll get your acceptance letter, then you'll get a separate email that will tell you to log in and how to log in for the first time as a Morehouse two student utilizing your M number and you have your My Portal. My Portal is the access that allows for you to get to all these apps to be able to do what it is you need to do to uh, assist your enrollment process. And so if he's having login issues, I myself, Michael Gum, Director of Admissions or any of the individuals in the admissions office can better assist that student uh, to be able to, to figure out and trigger what are the errors or what's happening for them not being able to get that done. So, sorry about that. So my portal is going to be that access. Um, so with the credentials, um, please reach out to admissions at morehouse.edu, admissions at morehouse.edu, and we can assist right there. Okay, so our next question is, what are the requirements for becoming a residential advisor? Ooh. Very great question. So uh, to become an RA, I'm not going to, you know, tell you a story or tell you tell you a fib. It's, it's a pretty extensive process um, because it's a lot of responsibility and a lot of reward as well. So to become an RA, uh, the process starts around October, so right after... Um, Halloween, right around Halloween, we have our first information sessions. And so we take attendance when you walk in and we take attendance when you walk out. We want to see who's there if you stay for the entirety of the session. And we kind of talk about expectations and compensation and just kind of the role. Um, and then from there, the application will open. You'll submit your application, letting us know that you are interested. 
And then from there, you will go to a series of leadership workshops. So no matter if you get the job or you don't get the job, housing is committed to developing your leadership skills. So you're going to walk away with something. You're going to walk away a changed person, more prepared to lead on this campus and beyond. So again, our commitment to developing our students is, is very deep, if you can't tell. So remember from the beginning, you got to come to the workshop. Um, I'm sorry, the information session, then application, then a series of workshops that may happen over six weeks. Um, and then from there, there's a hire me fair. Imagine like a third grade science fair where you have your board and you're just kind of doing your elevator pitch about who you are and why you should be hired. And then that's it. So from there, we gather all the scores and um, we decide who will move forward in, in the RA process. So again, we have about 55 actual spots for RA roles. Um, and those who may have fallen a little bit short, they may become an ARA, which is an alternate RA. So if any of the 55 you know, fall from glory and they, they cannot fulfill their role, we pull from that ARA pool and, and put someone in that spot, if that makes sense. So that's the process. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, and that's a great, great question um, that was asked about um, housing. Um, there's a question about when will aid packages be mailed out? I know we sort of answered that one already. Um, when does the housing application open? We answered that as well. Um, I'm just trying to get make sure we have these done. Oh, can an incoming freshman be a commuter student? They can, yes. Okay. So there is uh, definitely that. Um, just making sure we cipher through these. We got through a lot, you all, and there's some 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 over some ones that are kind of repetitive. Okay, this is a good question. Which house would an undeclared major reside in? That is a good question. Um, it can really run the gamut. It's where we end up having space. Um, yeah, it's you know it can be any of the houses, so you can't go wrong, and you will be amongst maybe other people who are also undecided. Yeah. Got it. Um, there is a question here, and I can probably answer it. Thank you for the informative event. We appreciate it. Do you have any details about the Dr. May Stamp Scholarship? So right now, the Stamp Scholarship is under review. Uh, we have uh, it allotted for, and the donors are definitely supporting. Uh, stamps is an awesome opportunity. And so we are in connection and communication about the Stamp Scholarship a little bit more in detail. So more information is to come on the Stamp Scholarship, but when that comes, it will come through the Academic Works portal. Again, we're talking about the access to my portal first and then being able to actually um, go into Academic Works to be able to see that scholarship and to be able to apply for it when you're auto-matched. So uh, more to come on the STAMP scholarship, good question. Um, oh, are there limited single rooms and are there first come first serve? Or is there or are there limited single rooms and are we first come first serve as it relates to housing, Dr. Lee? Gotcha. So limited single rooms, absolutely. So as I shared earlier, especially for our incoming freshmen or our first year students, the likelihood of you having a roommate is extremely high. So we're gonna lean into that brotherhood. Um, it's just kind of um, few and far between that a student would have a single room, they would need an accommodation. So again, that's a student who may use a wheelchair or a student who may have a service animal. So very specific reasons why you would need that whole space to yourself outside of that buckle up because you're going to have a brother who lives um, with you. So I just like to manage expectations early on. And then is it first come first serve as it pertains to housing? Yes, but I don't want to create a panic. There's more than enough housing for our first year students. It's just important that you complete all of the um, re requirements before the deadline, because after that, then we'll start moving to our upperclassmen who also want to live on campus. So it just kind of it's in your best interest to fill out everything in advance and there's more than enough as long as you, you know, do everything in advance or by the deadline. Awesome. And Dr. Lane, this one kind of comes back up and it's good. When I'm paired with my compatible person and it turns out that it's not working, 
what are the next steps? Yeah. Sometimes we have a roommate that it just doesn't work out. Yep. And that is, I won't say very common, but it's, you know, I, this isn't my first rodeo. So I've seen it. Um, and so what we try to do is we'll try to mediate it first and kind of understand what's going on. Where's the disconnect happening? Because although when people think about going away to college, they think that all the learning happens in the classroom. But there's learning that happens in your residential house as well. And so you're learning to coexist with someone else. You're learning about someone else's differences. You're learning how to advocate for yourself. So as leaders and educators in this space, we will try to mediate the conversation. If it's beyond repair or something egregious happens, of course, we will hold students accountable in their appropriate way. And at the end of the day, if we need a roommate switch, we can do a roommate switch. And so um, you're, you're never locked in or stuck. We want you to be comfortable where you lay your head at night because we know that that will impact how you perform in the classroom and just, you know, your overall well-being. We care about our students. Awesome. I just want to segue real quick. Um, great, <laughs> great answers are being returned. Great questions are being asked. So this is really, really awesome, you all. Um, and I know we're coming short to time and we want to respect everyone's time. Um, but I, I know we have about maybe four more minutes in this session. Uh, what I want to do first is to just announce that Admitted Student Weekend will be released soon and that a lot of the questions you all have on this platform can be answered during Admitted Student Weekend as well, right? In person, face-to-face -face with our stakeholders and our leaders. And so um, there's a lot of good questions here. There's a lot of great answers in return. So thank you all um, for being a part of this. I want to get this question though. Uh, is there a summer bridge program? And if so, when? So Dr. Crosby, if you can kind of hint to that. And then Marie, um, talking about summer bridge a little bit. What is it? Who runs it? And what's the focus of it? You want me to go ahead, Dr. Crosby? Okay. That's yeah. Fine, yeah. Okay. So we have two uh, programs that I'm aware of. We probably have a lot more, but uh, I know for sure. So the first is our pre-summer program, and it's a wonderful opportunity for our incoming freshmen to get ahead. They can earn up to nine credits at a really reduced rate um, per credit hour rate. Um, information about that hopefully will be coming out next month in April um, for students to apply. It is an online program, so I, I want to stress that. Um, since the pandemic, it's been online, but once again, it's an opportunity for students to get their feet wet, um, under get some of the courses taken, and to get nine credits at a reduced weight. The Atlantic, we are part of the Atlanta University Center, uh, and that's open to all majors. We're part of the Atlanta University Center, and the Atlanta University Center Consortium offers a dual degree engineering, also summer program. That program, that summer program is by invitation. There is no cost. However, you must be um, pursuing um, the dual degree engineering, one of the dual degree engineering majors. Um, and again, that information will be coming out soon directly from the Atlanta University Center. And once again, they uh, make their selections between students at Clark, Morehouse, and Spelman. But there'll be a link. They normally send out um, uh, interest requests to all of the students. We send an interest request out to any student um, that has applied for dual degree um, engineering or has indicated they're going to major in that area. I don't know, Dr. Crosby, did I miss any others? I think the others uh, not for first time. Yeah, PSAP and MAP. Yeah. I forgot about that. That's right. Yeah. Which so is you might see it called PSAP or you might see it called MAP, but they're the same. Excellent, excellent. Um, and so we also want to make mention as well as we're kind of winding down to time uh, is that um, a lot of these questions that you are asking, some of them are pivoting to scholarships. So I'm just going to make a general kind of note on scholarships in general. Um, some of you all have been accepted and you've recently been accepted and you're wondering, well, what about the other internal institutional scholarships that can be offered? Um, right now, we're actually over, uh, doing examinations and reviewing for scholarships through the Academic Works Portal. Um, there's a process called AutoMatch, and that process allows for those scholarships to link up to your account. There's one big, strong piece of information that we're all waiting on, and it's unfortunately the, the, the financial aid piece. 
Um, and so because we're awaiting the government's uh, focus and allowing you all to actually create or do your FAFSAs while also retrieving that information, it's put a lot of our scholarship opportunities on hold. And so we have you, you are in our system. Um, you will be reviewed based on your merit, based on your skill set and the donor's uh, desire for what that scholarship entails. Um, but it is a waiting game at this point. So be patient with us as we kind of uh, inform you of those scholarship decisions. Um, what I will say is that right now, what's not holding up are external scholarships. So don't just focus on what Morehouse is doing. By all means, become a part of UNCF, United Negro College Fund. You know, create your account, create your account through FastWeb and College Board. You just want to make sure that if you don't have an institutional scholarship coming into Morehouse, that you have external scholarships to support you before you actually make the decision to come to Morehouse. So by all means, please, please, please equip yourself so you're not in a situation, okay? Um, we will do what we can, but we're limited in a lot right now. And so uh, we wanna best support all our, our, our folks as best as we possibly can. Um, I know that there's other questions and there's so many, uh, so what I want to do is uh, we are now at the time we might go maybe, I think, five more minutes, if that's OK with the, the panelists. Uh, and then we will we will end there. Um, you know, I think this is probably the one or one of the ones that actually went over in terms of the time. And we're very thankful for all of you all who have stayed on um, to get this pivotal information. Um, there is a question about crown form. Can freshmen take the crown form? And that answer is? Yes, you have to. <laughs> it is a requirement. It's a graduation requirement, yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, let me see here. Yeah, we're just getting a lot of love, a lot of love, you all, from the people in the chat. Um, someone said they might not be able to make a minute student weekend. Well, I would say please schedule a tour, right? Um, you can get to us. You just have to come to campus <laughs> and engage with us and ask those questions and get the information. So don't let um, prom hold you back. Now, go ahead and skip prom and just come to us. That's fine, too. Um, you know, it's not that important. You can always have another prom. <laughs> but I mean, I, I want you to enjoy prom. Go to prom. Just let us know where you are in your, in your, in your you know, pathways and just engage with us. Ask us questions. Um, you know, we are in the process of revamping um, our website, so there'll be some new information that you will see and some new things that are forthcoming. So it's going to be important for you all to be able to connect with us. Um, but in the meanwhile, we do have third party opportunities uh, where we can engage and get those questions answered that you have. OK, um, I will say this and I'm getting the hook. Um, someone asked the question, when is the first day that students must be present on campus? So when do students actually need to arrive? And Marie, I know you're the, the queen of scheduling here. Uh, so we're going <laughs> we to throw that one to you. And we can make a general claim and just say the first week in August. Uh, but you tell us. Oh, go ahead, Marie. I didn't hear you. You're muted. I got to get myself off mute. So the first <laughs> day of class is August 21st. Um, and as, as uh, Michael indicated, we are in the process of updating our website and that information will be there soon. I will say that August 8th, I believe it is, is going to be um, our virtual orientation. We offer a vir virtual orientation before actual move-in check-in date. Right. And check-in will be some around move-in will be August 14th and that's the on-campus orientation. And then you'll do that for about a week with the first day of classes starting on the 21st. So again, yes. our calendar will be updated, but August 8th is our virtual orientation. Um, and August 14th right now is slated that Wednesday or Thursday, August 15th for move in. And then the first day of classes will be the following week on the 21st. Thank you for that. So what I wanna do uh, at this point, you all, we are going to, to stop. Um, what I would love for us to be able to do, um, and just so that everyone's aware, the questions that have come in um, are recorded in our session here, which is excellent. So we will be able to get back to you. Um, so that's one. Two, as it relates to our Admitted Student Weekend,
that's a real pivotal opportunity to really get a lot of these questions that you have now answered. So coming to our campus, scheduling and confirming is going to be critical. So we'll make sure a link is sent in this chat uh, so that you know where to register. Um, you know, we do have capacity limits and we want to make sure we get everybody um, apart and associated as quick as possible. So April 18th, April 19th, and April 20th. Uh, program Programmatic pieces are being finalized. Uh, we are talking to our stakeholders about how we're going to have fun and engage and build rapport with you all while you're here and really celebrating your success of becoming a man and for a man of Morehouse in that focus of becoming a Morehouse man. So um, we are, again, super excited to uh, to have you all on this platform. And this has been an amazing, amazing session. I feel like there needs to be like a part two almost because there's so much detail, so much information that you all just need to know. And our team members have done an excellent job, um, you know, really fine tuning and, and getting to the nuts and bolts of this session. So I definitely wanna allow them to close out with their closing remarks. And so we'll start first with Dr. Lane. Dr. Lane, can you just, um, you know, inform our new families and students, what are the things that they wanna be prepared for coming into Morehouse? And then in your area, you know, what are some success tips that you can give them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're going to have a lot of fun in housing. A lot of their memories, their core memories, their Morehouse experience when they sit back years from now and they reflect on all the good times that they had, that they had a lot of that will happen um, in our houses. And um, that's really a source of pride for me and the way that we train our staff and our student staff. Um, yeah, we just put a lot of time and energy into that to make sure that those good memories are are cultivated. Um Sorry, I was trying to answer questions in um, in the chat as well. One thing that I did want to share, I, I saw a lot of people asking about upperclassmen application dates and how we didn't talk about that as far as the housing application. So that is a separate process and so we didn't want to confuse you. I think the session was more geared towards our incoming and prospective students, uh, but I'll just throw the, these dates out there between April 10th and April 15th. Depending on the classification, that's when upperclassmen will have access to the housing application but they must register for classes first before the application is open. So register for classes um, for our upperclassmen. So yeah, I just hope that that's helpful to, to those who are asking. I saw it a few times. Dr. Lane, awesome. And then uh, what is your generic or general um, inbox that you send students to who have questions on housing? Yeah, well, actually, I'll send them straight to me. <laughs> um, so it's Naji, it's my first and last name, if you can see it here, uh, N-I-J-E dot L-A-N-E at morehouse.edu. I'm okay with that. So awesome. Our Director of Housing, thank you so, so much. Um, Dr. Crosby, Crosby you know, um, can you give us some tidbits and some pieces that is necessary for us to know, as well as your closing statement and remarks about Morehouse and the significance of Morehouse? Yeah, so first, let me just say, um, we are excited that you all will be coming here. Uh, there's nothing better than August at Morehouse College. It's just so much fun and so much going on. The campus has come completely alive. So we are looking forward to seeing you here um, and working with you this entire first year, um, especially the division advisors. So that's our highlight. You make us want to come to work. <laughs> so. Um, we are definitely looking forward to seeing you. So I can't stress this enough. In preparation for all the excitement, we need you to read your email. <laughs> so we know you're going to get lots of emails, but we're asking you take the time to read the information that we're giving you and follow what we're asking you to do. I promise it's not as painless as you think it is. It will go really smoothly if you just kind of follow the steps that we're giving that we've laid out for you all. But please read your email. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Doc, uh, Dr. Crosby, again, thank you so much. A wealth of information as well. Um, and of course, Marie Brown, our registrar. Marie, you know, you kind of sit in the clutch of like everybody. Like your your hands are like admissions, registration. Blah, 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 right? And you got to kind of make sure that it all fits. So just in your in your standpoint, you know, what are some of the things and takeaways from your vantage point 
And then, you know, what has Morehouse been to you um, and working in this capacity? Yeah, I, I just want to echo what Dr. Crosby and Dr. Lane said, that we are excited about you coming. It's going to be a lot of fun. I don't, I am not over um, financial aid, but I do want to acknowledge, and I love that a lot of you had a questions. I want you to know that that is so important to us. Um, as Mr. Gum indicated, we are having weekly enrollment meetings um, to ensure that we are doing the best that we can. We have already had several conversations with the regional directors of the Department of Education as to how this is impacting our students. And we will make sure we take this information back. We know our financial aid department, so I wanna leave as a parting. Our financial aid department has started back their weekly calls about financial aid and scholarships with students. And we'll make sure that that information is sent out to all. So my parting words would be, be patient with us. Um, this FAFSA simplification process just really took, I think, every institution across the country. Um, so, so we hear you. I see from the emails, and as Mr. Gum said, we'll make sure we're doing that, but I want you to know that is a priority for us. That's a big concern, and we know that um, students and parents need to know how they're going to finance their education. We are hoping that that information will be provided by at the at the earliest um, late April, um, and once again, definitely, um, even if it's the last week in April before the payment deadline, we hope we'll be able to get um, the first um, set of uh, financial aid awards out. And once again, we'll take this back and share. But I love it here, and we're looking forward to seeing you all. If it, once again, all right. So you heard from our our subject matter experts. This has been an, an amazing pleasure. Our panelists, y'all are awesome in, in the enrollment calls and even outside the enrollment calls. So we'll be calling on y'all all the time. Thank you so, so much. Um, I know one of the things I want to make mention um, is uh, just a quote that I remember seeing when I would walk out of White Hall in my, in my freshman house. And I would see the, this quote that said, without struggle, there is no progress. Without struggle, there is no progress by Frederick Douglass. And so um, just to know that that's where you live to where you see, um, it is pivotal that we understand those pieces. So I am excited uh, for you all. I'm, I just can't wait. Um, we are saying that there's going to be a full schedule that's going to be released on Thursday of our admitted student weekend, just some tidbits here, um, and then say as well that we... Um, uh, when you log in, you'll be able to get that information. So we'll get that link sent to you all so you all can get there. But continue to work hard. Um, yep, there it is. So this is what we want you all to see. Uh, by all means, please, please, please know our dates. Plug in with us, connect with us, um, and be able to, to attend um, this next uh, opportunity to really see the major leaders, the major uh, individuals that make it happen. We, this is pretty much like the step-by-step -step process of enrollment while also just having fun and being a student uh, for the first time as a Morehouse student. So uh, we want you to plug in. So screenshot this, take a picture, um, and we will engage with you. I'll leave you with these parting words um, that there is no direct correlation that when you train a man's mind, you train his heart. The work that Morehouse does is not just to make you academically sound, but we also train really, really good characters. So uh, thank you all so very much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening and we'll see you next on our next Tiger Talk Tuesday. Uh, uh, that's forthcoming. So thank y'all.